I extend you the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning as we're beginning our Lenten journey today, first Sunday in Lent. We move into the Easter season, but to prepare for Easter, we take a time of 40 days of just reflecting on our sins and our need for the death and resurrection of our Savior for our eternal life. Today, our text for the message will be Genesis chapter 3, the Old Testament reading. Please join me in prayer. Father, there are many times we engage in conversations about you, about understanding your ways, about trying to figure you out in our personal lives, just trying to figure out what you are up to and what your goals are. Many times, O oh Lord, these conversations can lead us to anger, sometimes to doubt, and sometimes just to despair. Help us to understand, O oh Lord, the, the right balance about having conversations about you versus conversations with you, which we do when we give you praise, honor, thanks, not worrying about trying to fully understand or comprehend your being, your actions, but just thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us, especially in your son Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Dear friends in Christ, Genesis is filled with conversations God has with people. You know, at the very beginning, God has this conversation with Adam and Eve, right? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Chapter 1, right there, God is conversing with his creatures. When you look throughout the book of Genesis, you see a lot of conversations God has with Abraham and Jacob and other people like Moses and then also through the prophets, most of them are all men. Very rarely do you see God having one-on-one -on -one conversations with women in the Bible. Maybe he had plenty, but it was pointed out to me last night that there are only four women who had conversations with God that are recorded in the Bible. Eve, Sarah, Hagar, and Rebecca. What was also most fascinating about this revelation is that each of these conversations with women had to do with the promise of the birthing of a male child. Eve with the promised Messiah, Sarah with the promised child of Isaac, Hagar with the promised child of Ishmael, and Rebecca to the promise of the child of Jacob ruling over Esau. When you think of that, it gives kind of meaning to what St. Paul has to tell us in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women will be preserved through the bearing of children. But not only women, you might say men as well. For if the women would not have brought forth the Christ child, we wouldn't have the Christ child. How fascinating it is from Genesis chapter 3, 15, that when God brings Christ into this world, he promises right there with Eve, man will not be involved. It would be from her seed, not from his seed. And thus this all leads to the virgin birth of Mary. Women will be saved through childbearing, not necessarily personally of their own, but through the childbearing of the Christ over the history of time. So when you look at these conversations that God had with man and with women, we see that the first conversations that does take place with a woman by herself is Genesis 3. And it's not with God. It's with Satan. Satan. The first recorded woman conversation, solo, is with Eve and Satan. You would think that Eve had to be feeding her oats that day, pretty confident. That tree, which she had been told was forbidden, had to raise and peak a little bit of her interest of saying, what's so bad about that tree? You know, they say curiosity kills the cat. And so she, with her curiosity and with the boldness, believed that she could handle this tree. 
And she goes and there begins to engage in a conversation with the devil. The devil challenges Eve to make sure she understood the commandment, right? Did God really say you are not to eat from all the trees in the garden? Did, he, did, did you get that right, Eve? And Eve was really confident. She said, yeah, I got it right. We're not supposed to eat of it, nor shall we touch it. Because if we touch it, we shall die. And then the devil went the next step and said, you didn't get the commandment right because God didn't say anything about touching it. But do you really believe God's going to carry out his threat? Do you really believe that? So he says to her, you shall not surely die. It sets the table for the hook, which brings Eve down. And it is gossip. It is talk about God rather than with God. For the devil says to Eve, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan was trying to convince Eve that God was being selfish. He didn't really care about them. If he did care about them, he would see to their elevation. Elevation of knowledge and elevation of deity. God was being selfish. This is gossip. Because they're talking about God behind his back. And so when this gossip occurs, what should Eve have done? Should she have engaged in conversations about God at this moment? Or should she have engaged in conversations with God? To basically go to God in prayer and say, is this true? Are you being selfish, God? Do you really care about us, God? And let God have the chance to defend himself and let Eve know that the devil lies. But she did not have that conversation with God. She just concluded what her thoughts on conversations about God with the devil. And so the fall began. After she had ate of the knowledge of the tree in good and evil, she then had to give it to her husband. There's a difference between the fall. Even St. Paul recognizes this. Eve is deceived. She is taken advantage of. Her naivety is taken advantage of by the devil. But Adam is not so naive in the fall. Adam is given a choice. And it's a tough one. Should I fall into sin and my first allegiance be to my wife and therefore distance myself from God? Or should my allegiance be to my holy God and distance myself from my sinful wife? He knew what he was doing. There's no deception here. Adam made the choice, and you can kind of see how difficult it was due to the fact of what God says in Genesis 2 about the creation of marriage, that the two shall become one flesh, that what Eve does becomes Adam's, and what Adam does becomes Eve's. Therefore, when you look at these people making their defenses before God, it all makes sense, right? In Genesis 3, that Eve basically says, I was deceived, I was beguiled. He took advantage of me. Adam blamed God and said, this would not have happened if you would not have created woman and would not have created marriage. God, you're the fault of the fall because you created marriage to be like this. And you created this woman to be involved in this marriage process. He really doesn't blame Eve. He blames the creator of Eve for the problem. In all of this, as we get to see throughout life, conversations about God can sometimes be helpful and sometimes can be detrimental. Conversations about God need to be balanced with conversations with God. That's all I have to say. Pastor Craddock gave an illustration of that with this story. Young man, he was on fire for the Lord. 
He signed up for seminary thinking that was the best way he could serve God. I've been through seminary, I can tell you what it is. Believe me, there's a lot of conversations about God at the seminary. About what God is like, about what God does, about, 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 about. Because the goal of the seminary is to train young men to be pastors in the church and to give them knowledge about God. So they can share that knowledge about God with people. Some of this is called apologetics, and there's a need for apologetics. Defending our faith. But they are based about talking about God. So this young man went to the seminary, and he enjoyed the talks about God so much that he just focused and focused on his studies. But as time passed, his fire for God and Jesus dwindled. Before you know it, this bright, young, energetic man quit the seminary. Fred Craddock says the reason why is because he didn't take time to talk with God. Chapel. It's held every day at St. Louis Seminary. And believe me, during my times in the seminary, I was one of those that got so busy about talking about God, I skipped a lot of chapels. But when I had a chance to return to the seminary and continue to have studies about God in my Ph.D. process, chapel became one of my priorities. Talks with God can balance us correctly in our talks about God. So we don't lose this relationship. And we get it correct as we work through this journey with God, especially through the season of Lent. Um, there's a guy by St. Paul. He, he too had this issue about conversations about God and with God. And the one conversation he had that I want to point out today is the one in Romans chapter 11. Paul talks about soteriology, soteriology, and that's a $12 word for the way God saves people. And he's got a lot of things to say. He's trying to explain to the people in Rome of how God saved. He, he first of all, saved the Gentiles of the world by giving the people of Israel a spirit of stupor. He gave them eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And by their transgression... Salvation has come to the Gentiles, making them jealous, with hopefully saying that through jealousy God may move the Jews to believe in Jesus Christ. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And he continues on with trying to understand this methodology of God, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in, so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all. And Paul stops right there. Enough about God. Because now I'm beginning to lose it. And he makes a real sharp turn from 32 to 33. On verse 33, instead of talking about God, he starts talking with God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Praise be to God. Paul caught himself, knowing that this point in time, in this dialogue with the Romans, he needed to go from a conversation about God to a conversation with God, which includes worship and praise and thanksgiving for the incomprehensibility of God and his methods. Who understands the depths of his wisdom and knowledge? And he gives God thanks for the deepness of who this God is. This is a journey for us all as we continue to go through our own lives to understand how important conversations with God are. You know, C.S. Lewis, I ran across this quote a long time ago, and it impacted me. And I want to share it with you here this morning. 
we are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins, and that by dying, he disabled death itself. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. That's his doxology. But then he goes into the next paragraph about talks about soteriology, about salvation. And, and look how he sums this up. Any theories we build up as to how Christ's death did all this are, in my view, quite secondary. Mere plans are diagrams to be left alone if they do not help us. And even if they do help us, not to be confused with the thing itself. The first priority with the cross is to give thanks to God for it. As C.S. Lewis, it's not to talk about necessarily how it's done. It is beyond our human comprehension of how one person can save the world through his death of how that blood of Jesus Christ forgives us our sins, that is beyond our comprehension, our understanding. And C.S. Lewis got it so right. Let not those conversations about his blood and about his death, about how this all works, detract from the main thing, that it's been done. And then our first conversation as we face the cross is to give God thanks and praise, to have conversations with God for what is done in Jesus Christ. During the season of Lent, we're giving you an opportunity more to have conversations with God, right? Wednesday nights? I know it's a sacrifice to put another hour on your calendar to be here. But it's been a been sacrifice for Christ to do what he did, correct? But that extra hour, I would hope that you see it as a benefit, not as a burden because it's a chance to talk with God again. And I know those Latin services aren't those uplifting Easter services, but they're opportunities to sit down for introspection about who we are as sinners and why we need the cross and work out any anger with God. This morning, I had an interesting comment put by one of the students I teach for Concordia St. Paul or Concordia Portland. Not sure which campus she's working through. But as we wrapped up the class, she said she was kind of militant at the very beginning about this Christian stuff again. I have quite a few of those when we start. And she responded saying that I'm reconsidering all this thing about Christianity through this class. I'm reconsidering every thought I had about the Christian community, but I have a lot of anger towards God. And I just don't know what to do with it. And I shared with her in my comment back, I said, you know, since I believe God has created us in our image, that's once we come to peace with God, we also come to peace with ourselves. However I can help you fight that anger, work through that anger with God, I make myself available to you through email or call beyond the parameters of the class because maybe God has sent me into this person's life to help her have better conversations with God because all those Lenten conversations we're going to be having for the next five weeks they can do nothing but enhance that conversations with God and your doxology on your Easter celebration. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds. Christ Jesus.